Warm greetings, Code Monkeys and fellow Vedsies, and welcome back to Coded Lock Films. A little while back, I was talking about uh, Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. Um, I've actually talked about it uh, in two separate videos, uh, one I did by myself and one I did with Matt. But in the first video I did, which was by myself, I made sort of an offhand mention of uh, the fact that I probably shouldn't get into talking about my Harry Potter head cannons because I, I have a fair number of them. And people wanted me to talk about my Harry Potter head cannons, so that is this video. First of all, I will say that this list is by no means exhaustive. It's just sort of a sampling, a, a pick and mix of uh, the different uh, head cannons that I have about Harry Potter. So, in no particular order, here are a few of those. The first one is not so much uh, really a, a fan theory or a head cannon. Uh, it's, it's more so a piece of literary analysis that I just think is really cool and that I don't see brought up a lot in Harry Potter discussions, which is the fact that the obstacles that the trio face at the end of the Sorcerer's Stone kind of foreshadow the rest of the series. The first thing that they have to face is the Devil's Snare. Well, okay, it's actually the second thing that they have to face. The first thing that they have to face is Fluffy, of course. But it would be weird for the first book in the series to try to foreshadow itself, so we're just gonna kind of skip over that one. So yes, the Devil's Snare is a deadly plant that is much, much more dangerous than it first appears to be. Just by looking at it, you would never think that it's this thing that could cause such horrible pain and easily kill you if it wanted to. And this, to me, is analogous to Tom Riddle's diary. Tom Riddle's diary is, of course, also a relatively unassuming thing that is much more dangerous than it would appear to be just by looking at it, because it initially appears to be a relatively trustworthy source of information. It happens to be a book that can talk and think for itself, but, you know, it's magic, so what? But it is, in fact, much more dangerous than it appears to be because it, in fact, is one of Voldemort's horcruxes. We don't actually learn that it is a horcrux or what a horcrux even is until later books, but it still applies nonetheless. The second obstacle that they have to face is the broom and the winged keys. And Prisoner of Azkaban revolves a lot more around Quidditch than the rest of the books in the series. Yes, of course, in the Goblet of Fire you have the Quidditch World Cup where a major event happens, but the thing that's important in that instance is the event that happens after the World Cup, not the World Cup itself. And of course, Quidditch is a major thing throughout the series, but it's much more important in Prisoner of Azkaban. Not only is it really important to Harry because he wants to beat Malfoy, but it's also the impetus for him wanting to learn how to fight Dementors, and by so doing, metaphorically learn to begin confronting his own fear. The third obstacle is the life-size chess match, which is stylized like a graveyard, which is a pretty obvious one to me. It's a puzzle that leads to a graveyard. And what is the Goblet of Fire if not a series of puzzles that eventually leads Harry to a very important graveyard? The next obstacle is a nasty, mean, overbearing, cruel creature. In the Sorcerer's Stone obstacle, said creature is a troll. And in the Order of the Phoenix, it is Dolores Umbridge. The sixth obstacle is a potions puzzle, which is reflected in the fact that the sixth book focuses on potions a lot more than any other book in the series. There is, of course, Harry's old potions textbook, which once belonged to the titular Half-Blood Prince. And not only that, a huge portion of the sixth book is centered around Professor Slughorn, the new potions master. And finally, Harry finds himself facing off with Voldemort, just like he does in the seventh book. Like I said, that one's not really so much a fan theory as it is just a literary observation, but I think it's cool and I wanted to talk about it. But the first of the true head cannons that I am going to be talking about in this video is the fact that I believe that Draco Malfoy is a werewolf. I first learned about this particular fan theory through a YouTube channel called the Super Carlin Brothers. They talk a lot about both Harry Potter and Pixar, so I really enjoy their YouTube channel. And they have a video in which they explain the whole Draco Malfoy is a werewolf thing. And I'm just gonna link you guys to that video because honestly it explains the fan theory in a way that's really concise and really good. And also I just want more people to know about these guys. But yeah, Draco Malfoy is a werewolf go watch the video. No, not now. Wait till I'm done. The second headcanon I'm going to talk a little bit about is one that's kind of unusual, and when I first saw the video that was talking about this particular fan theory, I my first reaction was, you know what, no way. There's no way I'm gonna believe this one, but I just wanna see where they're going with it. But by the end of the video, I was blown away, and I fully accepted this one as a headcanon. And said headcanon is this, Dumbledore created a horcrux. I know, I know, it sounds weird, but it's honestly kind of damn brilliant. This is another instance where I am going to link you to a Super Carlin Brothers video, because although they did not come up with this particular fan theory, they expanded upon it in a really, 
really cool and interesting way. And it is in fact those expansions that made me ultimately accept this one as a headcanon of mine. But okay, I've linked you to two separate videos now, and I know that that probably seems like it's a little lazy. I'm honestly not trying to be lazy, I just want to give credit where credit is due, and in this case, I think that these two videos do a better job of explaining these things than I ever could. But I know that you guys are gonna wanna hear me directly talk about at least one headcanon. So I have one more that I want to address in this video, and this particular headcanon is actually one that I came up with entirely by myself. I am probably not the first person to think of this, but I haven't encountered this particular fan theory anywhere else on the internet. Not that I've looked particularly hard, but I haven't encountered it. This one I created entirely by myself. I was just thinking about Harry Potter one day, and this one really, really made sense to me. So here we go. Bellatrix was a Gryffindor. This one is almost entirely based on evidence of characterization. Because Bellatrix to me does not act much like a Slytherin. Obviously she's a pureblood and a rather fanatical one at that, which is typically a thing that is associated with Slytherin, I will grant you. But to me, the quintessential essence of a Slytherin is their creative cleverness. Slytherins are schemers and planners, and I just never really got that vibe from Bellatrix. The vibe that I do get from Bellatrix is someone who is extremely confident in her own power, for one thing. We can clearly see that Bellatrix never hesitates to throw her weight around. She is bold, she is brash, and she is perfectly willing to put herself in harm's way for the sake of the things she believes in. That sounds like a Gryffindor to me. There is, however, one big problem with this particular headcanon, and that is the fact that Sirius at one point says that all of his family have been in Slytherin. But this, to me, can very easily be explained away by just saying that Sirius didn't know Bellatrix was a Gryffindor. Because if you look at Sirius and Bellatrix's birth dates, you will see that they were actually born eight years apart, so they would have never gone to Hogwarts at the same time. But in fact, I don't actually believe that Bellatrix did go to wizarding school at Hogwarts. I believe that she initially was going to go to Hogwarts until her sorting ceremony where she was put into Gryffindor by the sorting hat. I believe that both she and her parents would have taken this as a great insult. How could their wonderful daughter not be a Slytherin? So rather than allow Bellatrix to be raised in Gryffindor house, her parents decided to take the somewhat unusual route of sending their child abroad. Which does happen in the Harry Potter series. At one point, Draco Malfoy said that his father considered sending him to Durmstrang instead of Hogwarts. So that just leaves us with the following question. To which foreign wizarding academy was Bellatrix sent? I believe that it was none other than the French wizarding academy, Beaubaton. And not only was Bellatrix Lestrange educated at Beaubaton, but that is also where she met her future husband, Rodolphus Lestrange. Like I said, just a fan theory, but it is my headcanon, and it is the lens through which I have come to see Bellatrix. But that, I think, is it for today. Please check out the Super Carlin Brothers videos that I have linked in the video description. They're super cool and super interesting and really well presented, well worth your time. And actually, what are some of your Harry Potter headcanons? I'd be interested in hearing about them. Just talk to me in the comments. I'll be down there talking about Harry Potter. That sounds fun, right? And until next time, Code Monkeys and fellow Vedsies, I will see you tomorrow.